Hey, Stephen Yandy here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernardston Auto Wrecking in Bernardston, Massachusetts with a 1965 Triumph TR4. A. Now the TR4 arrived in 1961 and ran through 1967 to replace the Triumph TR3. And you might wonder, what is that? Well, this is Car and Driver magazine right here, a fantastic magazine if you like sports cars. October 61, the new TR4 Triumph cutaway and check report. Inside, they tell you all you got to know about the old TR3 on the right and the modern TR4 on the left. Similar underpinnings, but as they say here, TR4, the car as a whole marks a turning point in TR history, bears practically no visible resemblance to its last of kin and embodies engineering changes that are also definitely advances. Here we have tread has been upped by a drastic four inches to 49 inches front 48 rear. The TR3s were 45. Next page, a little more data. And look at this beautiful cutaway picture right here. Now the circle in green, that's the rear axle. Notice how it has leaf springs and a live GKN, in other words, Spicer style rear axle. Well, that would change with the TR4A. More on that in a second. But again, the final pages here, they show the manual transmission of four speed right there, can handle up to 150 foot pounds, woohoo! But again, a little 2.1 liter four banger with twin carbs, not gonna break that transmission, but there it is, and on the right hand side, the old TR3 and four as they drive off into the sunset. Now getting back to the TR4A, we'll talk about that. And it all goes down to the rear suspension. We look right here, you can see these big cast aluminum things. This has independent rear suspension, and we'll get into that more in just a second. But one of the big things about the TR4 was the fact it was the first TR with roll-up side windows. And here's one of the doors right here. If we look, uh, yeah, inside, we can see right here the glass, the wind-up mechanism. And I don't think it's going to go up or down for us. Yeah, <laughs> one of the few things that still works on this lovely British car. There you go, right, look at that. It goes up and down. But again, the whole point of the TR4 ah, was increased comfort. In TR3 land, what you had was a plastic curtain that popped in like an old Corvette. Uh, but again, the TR3, first TR with a wind-up rear window, a side, side window, I should say. Now on this one here, this one is uh, pretty typical underneath. Notice little things though. The more you look, the more observant uh, it pays off to be. This little thing right here in the front coil spring, that is a aftermarket thing. You would screw that in there with a socket wrench to increase the height of the spring. So in other words, this spring was probably sagging. Somebody said, let's crank that thing in there for a last Hail Mary to get some more ride height. Disc brakes up front right here. These are girling, of course, standard stuff on the front of the TR3 as well. And look at this, here's the original intake manifold right here. Yes, twin carbs right here, twin SU side drafts feeding that inline four banger. Here's the aluminum casting, kind of a cool little piece, but again, standard equipment. This is not the muscle version. All TR4s came with twin carbs like this right here, feeding that 2.1 liter inline four. And here's the underside of that little engine right here. There was also a TR250 that arrived in 1965, but that would be a longer engine. This is the four banger for sure. And here's the starter motor right here that would go down right in there. And an old school piece, again, positive ground in England. These are actually the red to, to ground. And in this country, you start welding if you do that on a car. But again, in this period of time, it was a positive ground. But here's the thing, this starter motor right here was not the uh, last line of defense. If the battery died, look at this on the front of the crank. This is a snout right here that reaches through that allows you to hand crank the car if need be. There's actually a hole in the grill. So crazy but true, England was so sure of its uh, ability to uh, have a good functioning starter, they gave you a backup. Just like the Model T and Model A from Ford back in the 1920s and 30s. Now this one does have the optional uh, wire wheels. These were all of $150 right here. But here's the thing. The wires on this are painted, that's correct. Whenever you see a chrome wire wheel on a British sports car that's not factory stuff, it's custom stuff, that's okay. But these knockoffs usually have a little spinner right here, but check it out. Behind the knockoff is the girling brake, but just basically an adapter. This thing right here, this hub bolts to the studs 
which could also be used with a standard steel wheel if you didn't want to pay that extra money for the knockoff. So it's kind of interesting front and rear how uh, Triumph utilized the same bones uh, and a little adapter. Now again, Corvette did the same thing in 63 through 67. Uh, the bolt-on knockoff, the knockoff, that type of wheel was basically a standard hub that you could bolt a wheel to, but for the adapter that allowed the spin-on type knockoff to adapt. So Triumph was right in there with a lot of other British cars. And again, these were available with either of these knockoffs or bolt-on wheels. Uh, I can see the X-frame on this, pretty rugged stuff, but the money on this one here is the rear suspension. Now this is, once again, Car and Driver, that wonderful magazine for sports car enthusiasts then and now, May 1965. And inside here, here's the story, Road Research Report, Tri Triumph Tier 4A. Smoother, faster sailing with Triumph's new independent rear suspension. And we can see right here on the next page, the write-up on this thing. It says here that the TR4A's independent rear suspension has been borrowed almost in its entirety from the Triumph 2000 sedan. Up here, Triumph independent rear suspension. Each rear wheel is carried on a single member. These members are massive aluminum castings pivoted on rubber bushings at their forward end. The axle shafts themselves are carried in separate hubs that bolt onto the suspension members. The IRS final drive assembly uses much the same center section as the live range except, of course, that the live axle tubes should emerge from the gear casing or stub shafts for the U-joints. Drastic alterations in the frame section. We'll look at those in a second. The frame rails have been moved outward and then jog in just ahead of the rear wheels. The impression we get is that most of the previous frame has been utilized but very cleverly rearranged to do its new job. And again, finally, we have... Uh, these uh, parting words and stuff. And again, you know, great, great writing, car and driver then is now. And again, uh, here's the cutaway, and there is that independent rear suspension, quite different from the leaf springs and beam we saw in 1961 car and driver. So getting to the car itself, here we can see those big aluminum castings, these things right here, and they kind of almost even still work. You can see right there, and here are the half shafts, these things here that would go to the differential. Somebody snagged the diff, but right in here is where it would power these two half shafts to make the wheels turn. But here's the frame where they talk about the kick in, and basically they modified the standard frame without coming up with too much extra expense so that the rear suspension could be independent. Now there was also a thing called the TR250, which was a six cylinder version, and that also came with independent rear suspension. But the funny thing is in 65, Triumph TR4 could be sold as the four with the beam axle and and right next to it, the TR4A. So they sold them side by side. But finally for 66 and 7, the independent rear suspension, at least in America, was the standard fare. And again, we see the wire wheels at the tail of this one here. But something here, I think, that accounts for a lot of the rust on this one. Look at this. This is a winter snow tire, but look at the the uh, studs in this thing right here. Now, if you live in New England, you could actually have studs installed at your local gas station, which would then allow the tire to bite into snow and give you maybe twice as good traction on an icy surface and get you down the road. But why you drive a car like this in the winter, I don't know. But with that said, this is British metal. It's not really that well rust-proofed. So a couple of winters and these things start rotting. Now the problem with these cars is the frame rails are boxed. You can see right here, uh, this right here, there's a box section. As soon as moisture gets inside this thing, it can never get out. Same with salt water. So it finds its way out on its own through rust. And we can see right here, this thing is toast. But kind of cool little things. When it was new, somebody had some fun. The Great Britain sticker right there. If you've got a British car, you basically would be proud of it. I'm sure this car went down the road. Other people with their Triumphs and their Heelys and their Sprites would rave to each other, give a little toot, drive the little, the little driving gloves on. Meanwhile, a Hemi could would blow on by you sideways in third gear, rippling the tires. But with that said, sports cars like this were fun little cars. Not fast, but certainly agile. Now here's the reality. That rear suspension right there actually added a bunch of weight. Um, it probably improved the ride characteristic, but I would dare say that it wasn't necessarily an improvement on the racetrack. But with that said, you know, this basically was a, uh, a $2,840 car when it was new, which is 30% less than a Corvette. So, you know, a base Corvette Stingray 327 Roadster in 1965 or this. Well, you could save 30% and buy this and have just about as much fun until the light turned green. But the first corner, this thing do a pretty good job zipping around that Corvette or at least staying up with it. No problem. So that's the story of the Triumph TR4 
A, with the independent rear suspension or the IRS, one of the only times you do want to deal with the IRS, if you ask me. But with that said, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mag's YouTube channel, like this video, share it with a friend, and hit the bell so you're aware of the next video, which happens tomorrow morning.